Coming up on the Wednesday edition of Carolina Week. Carolina has a new plan to become first in the nation. We'll tell you how. And then a survivor returns to the torture center that's haunted her for decades. In sports, the stellar play of underclassmen has propelled the men's soccer team to number four in the nation. But two seniors are the backbone of the team. Plus a look at your Carolina Week four-day forecast. Carolina Week starts right now. From the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, this is Carolina Week. Good evening and welcome. You're watching the Wednesday edition of Carolina Week. I'm Lydia Garlico. And I'm Tara Higgerson. UNC officials want to make Carolina the number one public university in the country. And that takes money. The university gets only about 20% of its funding from the state, making raising funds vitally important. Reporter Chris Walker is live in the studio. Tara, university officials are hoping to raise the bar for UNC by raising the Carolina First fundraising goal by 200,000 bucks to a total of $2 billion. The evidence is all around us. From construction to the classroom, the Carolina First campaign is making visible changes at UNC. The campaign kicked off in 1999 with a $1.8 billion goal. Director of Development Communications Scott Ragland says the success of the campaign allowed Carolina First to aim higher. 1.8 was certainly an ambitious goal, and we felt like that we could do it, but it would be a, a challenge. And so we've just been so pleased by by the momentum that we do have and, and that two billion is within reach. This graph shows how the money raised will be distributed among three areas that benefit scholarships, faculty endowments, and building funds. In terms of you know, merit scholarships uh, makes us competitive in terms of bringing the best students to Chapel Hill. Faculty support obviously helps us retain and recruit the best faculty. And then the buildings, if you don't have top-notch facilities, then that makes it uh, more difficult to attract the best. Some of those facilities include the Sonia Haynes Stone Center and the newly renovated Memorial Hall. The extra $200,000 will also support technological advancement, like the Renaissance Computing Initiative, or RENC. Deputy Director of RENC, Alan Blatecki, says the program makes Carolina a national leader in the tech field. The uh, Renaissance Computing Institute is, is fairly unique in the country because we're talking about basing it on collaboration from the outset. With more than $1.5 billion raised thus far, officials expect to meet the new goal of $2 billion by the end of 2007. All of Carolina First fundraising comes from private donors like corporations and Tar Heel alumni. Tara? Thanks, Chris. Clearly, our campus is growing, and coming here could get a lot more affordable for the state's 300,000 undocumented immigrants. Right now, they have to pay out-of-state tuition, but that could change if Congress approves a new bill. The bill would require universities to admit undocumented immigrants as in-state residents. If approved, the bill would overturn North Carolina's current policy. Elizabeth Lindzan is a member of CHISPA, the Carolina Hispanic Association. She says the bill is a small step in the right direction, but still doesn't do enough. We're, we're going to have to progress in baby steps, but we also have to take that in consideration on how they're going to pay and how they're going to get to be able to attend, not only to be accepted, but to be able to come to the university. The bill is aimed at giving second generation immigrants easier access to higher education. University employees are dealing with a hefty increase in their monthly premiums on their state health plans. These UNC employees will have to pay more, 11% more, to have health coverage. The state budget passed last month, put the increase into effect October 1st. University Benefits Director Elaine Phelps says UNC doesn't control the increase. She hopes there will be better options for state employees in the future. I would like for the state and UNC here at Chapel Hill to continue to look at other health care uh, alternatives, other initiatives that can provide the same level of benefits at a lower cost, and there are alternatives out there. The cost for family coverage went up about $43 per month. Coverage for a child will cost another $22 per paycheck. The administrative office has received complaints but says the state legislature controls any increases. What do you hate more, junk mail or bills? Probably bills, especially when they're higher than expected. 
If you're an orange water and sewer authority customer, when you open your bill this month, you'll find a hike in water and sewer rates. Owasa Finance Director Kevin Ray says they need the money to renovate wastewater treatment plants, improve water quality, and add a second generator for standby power in emergencies. Owasa, in an attempt to be proactive, we have tried to program in in smaller increments rather than waiting for our infrastructure to crumble around us. We are attempting to make sure that it's in good shape now uh, through rehabilitation, uh, a rather aggressive rehabilitation program that we have. Ray says a typical household uses 6,000 gallons of water per month, so the average water and sewer bill will go up between three and four dollars. Despite a little bit of rain on Wednesday, the Triangle area is almost five and a half inches below normal rainfall for the year. Reporter Shaheen Sayal comes to us from the Jordan Lake with a check of what this drought means for you. Lydia, many people are concerned about how a statewide drought may affect their daily lives. Even though officials are encouraging people to conserve water during these times, they're also saying that some residents around the state may not need to worry too much yet. Jordan Lake usually sits 216 feet above sea level. Because of below average rainfall this year, the lake is close to four feet lower than normal. Persistent drought conditions have officials trying to decide whether to enforce mandatory residential water restrictions. But operations manager with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Daniel Brown, says because Jordan Lake's reservoir is close to full right now, there's no need to restrict water usage just yet. Currently we have still 95% of our water supply pool, so it's not an immediate concern, but certainly should the drought continue, folks should take uh, voluntary conservation measures. The Corps is responsible for managing water levels at Jordan Lake and is trying to keep them as close to normal as possible. Recently the Corps slightly reduced the amount of water that flows downstream as a way to conserve the lake's current usable water supply. Though customers who rely on Jordan Lake for water will hardly notice any effect in terms of water consumption, Brown says the public will feel most of the impact when it comes to recreational water activities. Jordan Lake's park superintendent, Megan Lynch, agrees. Whenever it hits around 213, it does start impacting some of the boat ramps and that we have to close them down because they're shorter ramps so that when people back down, they go off the end of the cement pad and it's usually muddy and it's really hard to pull the trailer back out. If Jordan Lake's river basin does get significant rainfall, lake levels may rise. It does look like it's a cloudy day here at Jordan Lake, but even so, October is one of the driest months, so officials are going to have to keep a close watch on the situation. Lydia? Shaheen, now what about water restrictions in surrounding areas that use other reservoirs? Well, even though Falls Lake, which is Raleigh's primary reservoir, is six feet below normal, officials have decided to hold off on mandatory restrictions for the time being. Uh, Durham is sticking to voluntary limits for now, and Apex has actually certain implemented certain restrictions, such as watering lawns every other day. Lydia? Shaheen Sayal reporting from Jordan Lake. Thanks, Shaheen. It might seem like construction is taking over Chapel Hill, but now the town council is trying to fight back. Although new developments are springing up every day in Chapel Hill, some land remains untouched, and Chapel Hill's town council is eager to preserve it. Recently, the council spent $1 million to buy 23 acres of open space. 10 acres lies just beyond this condemned house near Estes Park. Another 13 acres is south of city limits. City council members say their main concerns are to protect the town's natural beauty and to give residents some breathing room. And last week we told you about the Triangle Transit Authority new, um, new plans for a commuter rail system. That's right, but those plans have now come into question. It looks like these students will have to keep riding the bus for the time being. Federal officials want more information about how many people might quit driving and start riding the train. TTA has until October 14th to submit the numbers to be considered for next year's budget. General Manager John Claflin describes the project as building for the future. It provides for economic development in and around each of those stations in an area that's under, underdeveloped today, but could, could bring substantial tax benefits, uh, sales tax benefits, property tax benefits to the, each of the counties as a result of the growth that would come. TTA estimates that by the year 2020, the project will bring in more than 46,000 new jobs.
after years of human rights violations, survivors are demanding vindication. Chile's dark history uncovered and revisited through the experiences and memories of a survivor. Coming up. Hey, I was checking you out. I was thinking, how about you come on to my car and we can have a couple beers, fool around a little bit. You know, I, I can give you herpes. Okay, yeah, that sounds great. Mad faced the brutal truth about underage drinking. Want to feel appreciated? When you spend time with kids, anytime, it helps prevent crime. This summer, reporters Sean Maroney and Christy Keck traveled to Chile to investigate human rights abuses. And Christy joins us in the newsroom with the latest in our series of special reports. Monday I told you about Chile's violent past. During Augusto Pinochet's dictatorship, the secret police held thousands of political opponents in torture centers. I visited one such place in Santiago and walked the path of the prisoners with a survivor. Here's her story. This was the place for the most horrible thing that a human being can do to another human being. This place, the Via Grimaldi, Chile's most notorious torture center. It was a place to torture the people. The purpose is to destroy the people. Lelia Perez was one of nearly 5,000 people detained, interrogated, and tortured at the Via Grimaldi. Living in these extreme conditions changed your perception, changed everything. Most of the time, we have the relation only because of the sounds. The sounds of the city, the planes, footsteps. Or because we counted the steps. Those were our uh, connections with the, with the world. Just a few steps and Pears arrives here. Las Casas Curvy, or Curvy Houses. And sometimes there were four or even five people here. If you want to, to see that, I don't want to go there again. That was just the beginning. Drawings by survivors show what Perez calls the three steps of torture. The first step was this, the grill, the parrilla with electrical shock. The second step was uh, when I was tied, tied up, it's called tied up to a chair. For me, the third step was when they hanged me. Perez was 17 at the time and pregnant. I was not cooperating in the way they wanted. So I was hanged in this beautiful tree and uh, they produced uh, an abortion. Paris lost her baby, and she feared she would lose her life, too. I thought in that moment, well, I'm dying. That's it. I'm dying. As she lay in a cell near the tree, she took what she thought would be her last breath. But then she heard the voice of a friend, Jorge Fuentes Alarcón, calling to her from a neighboring cell. In that moment, he saved my life. Because he called me, and uh, he brought me. You know, so... He connected me to, to this life again. After the Via Grimaldi closed, the center caught fire several times. But out of the ashes, this tree remains standing. Paris says what once represented death now symbolizes a renewal of life. I normally go there and light a candle for my daughter because I have the feeling that it was a daughter. Not far from where Paris remembers her daughter, she remembers the man who saved her life. Jorge Fuentes Alarcón. He's one of the 226 victims listed on the wall of the names. So why does Paris choose to come back to the place where so many of her friends died? I can meet my friends here and we heal together. The memory of my friends who died here is not forgotten. Here happen terrible things and here people can learn. And we can read a lot of books but when the history doesn't touch your heart, it is not important. And here, the history can touch your heart. 
So she returns to the Via Grimaldi to remember the pain of the past and develop hope for the future. Just this week, Chilean courts received an application for withdrawal of Pinochet's immunity for his involvement in the disappearance of dozens of people from the Via Grimaldi. He's yet to stand trial for any of his crimes against humanity, and as the aging general's health declines, most doubt he ever will. That's truly a very, very moving story. Thanks, Christy. And if you want to learn more about Lelia Perez and her story, check out, check out our website, carolinaweek.org. You don't have to travel abroad to fight for human rights awareness. This week, students on campus are focusing on Africa through a National Day of Fasting. In preparation for the national event, Students United for Darfur Awareness Now, Sudan for short, has had a table in the pit to encourage students to sign up to participate in the fast. The group also held a 30-minute vigil Tuesday night to remember all the victims of racial violence in Darfur. Sudan's events coordinator, Tracy Boyer, says the group wants to raise awareness about genocide and participating in the fast is a great way to do it. And once more people around the campus know our organization and know what we're trying to do, then we hope to bring in speakers and do other events, more of getting petitions signed and calling our representatives rather than just saying, hey, this genocide is going on. The group will break the fast on Thursday with a 7 p.m. dinner in the pit. You can help out with global relief efforts each week. All you have to do is stop by the Hunger Lunch in the Pit, hosted by Nourish International. $3 will buy you all you can eat. The group has been selling meals of beans and rice to students since 2002. They serve lunch every Wednesday, all semester long. Those are two moving stories, as you said, but hopefully, weathercaster Rob Ellis, you can bring us some better news. Yeah, we've heard that North Carolina, we have had a drought, so is there any rain coming our way? Well, there actually is some rain in the forecast. We have a disturbance off the coast. And I'll tell you whether Tropical Storm Tammy is going to cause trouble for your weekend plans coming up. Are your kids getting enough art? Whether through poetry, dance, music, or drama, the arts open the doors to creativity. As a mother and teacher, I know that arts education can help our children develop confidence and a better understanding of the world around them. Even if you have just 30 minutes a week, get your kids more involved in the arts and think about the kind of world we can leave behind for our children and our children's children. Art. Ask for more. AmericansfortheArts.org Daddy, why is the sky blue? Well, to match your pretty eyes. Nope, not even close. See? All colors have wavelengths that are diffused by oxygen and nitrogen. Since blue is the shortest wavelength, it's diffused up to 10 times more. Who taught you that? Mommy. By age 12, too many girls lose interest in math and science and their chance at future jobs. Keep her interest alive. Know why mathematics is the basis of life as we know it? You tell me. It's her future. Do the math. Well, time now to take a look at your Carolina Week weather. I'm weathercaster Rob Ellis. It does look like we will have some showers in the forecast for this weekend. We have a disturbance coming through as well as troublesome Tammy, our tropical storm Tammy that's off the coast of Florida that's going to be bringing the chance for showers into the Chapel Hill area. And because we do have those showers in the area, the temperatures are going to stay mild. So it will be a little showery and a little bit cool, but we may be able to salvage part of the weekend. I'll tell you about that coming up. Let's take a look at the satellite map and we'll take a look at all the weather and green that are going to make this weekend forecast. Start out, we had high pressure most of this week that actually brought us some great conditions for the early part of the week. But as you can see, here is Tropical Storm Tammy. And as this system begins to move into South Carolina and North Carolina, that moisture is going to come up into our area and provide us a chance with additional showers. Out west, we also have this cold front. And as that cold front pushes through, it's actually going to merge with Tammy. And once they push out, we will see some clearing. And that may take place on Sunday. Let's take a look at the surface map, and I'll show you where that front is going to move to. It'll move east, and as it does, here comes Tammy, and this front will push Tammy out of the way and may salvage some of that rainfall, but we're actually glad to get some of that rainfall. As you heard earlier, we are a little low for the year. Let's go ahead and take a look at a closer look of, of Tropical Storm Tammy. Here's the system, and the center is actually located right here, and you see a lot of the cloudiness off to the north of the system, and that's actually not uncommon for this time of year, so we hope that uh, it'll move out quickly. Let's go ahead and take a look if you're heading out to the beach. 
I'm sorry, for your four-day forecast, we'll start out Friday and Saturday, rain in, in the area, 70s for your high temperature, lows overnight around 50, but we will clear out by Sunday and into Monday, temperatures of around 70 degrees, lows overnight, though, as that cold front pushes through of around 46 degrees. And if you're heading out to the beach, probably not the best weekend to do so with Tropical Storm Tammy off the coast, highs of around 70, lows overnight, 60 and 55. And if you're making it out to the mountains, you may miss those showers, but it is going to be a little chilly, lows overnight and the low 40s, highs of around 60 to 65. And if you're game day, if you're heading out to Louisville, Kentucky, Papa John's Stadium kickoff at 430, 63 degrees, partly cloudy skies. So if you're heading out that way, you may miss the rain from Tammy, but we sure need it here. And we're certainly hoping that we will get more rain than damage. Thanks, Rob. All right, Heather Catlin's here to talk sports. We've won Carolina is one away and home. Now Carolina's away again. Yes, we're going to Louisville, and um, I know I'm not going. So if you're going, if you're not going, catch it on ABC 11. So, but first, coming up on Carolina Week Sports, revenge is the dish best served cold. Will the Heels be able to serve up a cold plate to Louisville like they did against Utah last week? Find out coming up. I give you a 20, I'm sure of it. But I... That's, you're stupid. I'm Children are influenced by what they see adults do. Remember, a child may be watching you. There is really only one boy. One girl. One tree. One forest. One ocean. One mountain. One sky. And one simple way to care for it all. Please visit earthshare.org and learn how the world's leading environmental groups are working together under one name, Earthshare. One environment, one simple way to care for it. Welcome to Carolina Week Sports. I'm Heather Catlin. Another week, another chance for revenge for the football team. Last year, Louisville trounced Carolina to the tune of 34-0. Coach John Bunning and players know they're going to need great defense to prevail this weekend. It's good to be able to play, you know, a team that really gave it to us last year, 34-zip, actually. And uh, they did it to us in front of our home crowd, one of the two teams that beat us here. And, uh, you know, we're looking forward to going up there to Papa John Stadium and really putting out a great effort. I really have a, a lot of faith in our defense to, to really you know, stop Louisville and, and, and you know, keep them from scoring. They've done an outstanding job this year against some really good offenses, keeping them to low yards, low points, and, and creating turnovers and setting our offense up to score some points and put some points on the board. But we're not consistent running the ball, and, and we've failed uh, in the red zone to score at all at times uh, relative to either a, a turnover or or miss field goals. You know, the, the goal is to put points up, and that's what we're trying to do here this week. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to not make critical mistakes that have been hurting us these last few weeks and stuff like that, and you know, go out and, and really show what this offense can do this week. The offense needs to hit its stride soon. Carolina plays ranked opponents in three of the next four games. The Heels' toughness will be tested against Louisville this weekend, while the men's soccer team faced a tougher-than-expected Elon team on Tuesday. Elon showed, us, showed they weren't scared of the heels and proved they wouldn't be pushed around. But Carolina still had plenty of chances to put the game away early. Carolina was clearly frustrated by missed opportunities. Both teams battled their way through two overtimes until the shot by Dax McCarty won it for the heels in the second overtime. McCarty knows even ugly wins can benefit the team. We're not peaking too early, and uh, I think it's better for us that you know we're getting we're getting the, the bad games out of the way early. You know we can we can play bad but still win. So fortunately, that's going to help and help us in the end. The men's soccer team is off to the best start since winning the national championship in 2001. Two seniors hope to bring home another title in their final year at Carolina. Cassie King has their story. There are only two seniors on the men's soccer team midfielder Ty Allison and goalie Ford Williams. Being one of two seniors is, is kind of tough uh, because there's not as many people to lead. The duo has had to step it up and lead in big ways, but each player leads differently. Goalie Ford Williams sets an example on the field. I have to set the tone and set an example, uh, especially being in the back. 
uh, for guys. So if we are in a tough situation or something, they can turn around and, and maybe see someone sitting solid and calm in the back, and maybe that gives them a calming feeling as well. Ty, who has been plagued with injuries, including a broken foot, is more of a leader off the field. I mean, my team role is uh, academic team captain and to make sure that uh, freshmen are getting to their classes. Both men are excited about the team's success this year. Finally, this is our first year that we're out of the shadow of the national championship. And, um, you know, we got, we got good freshmen that have come in and have made a big contribution. This contribution is good enough to rank the team in the top five in the nation. And the seniors know that this is their last season. I'm very excited about it, you know. It's, it's big time because this is our, our last year. I mean, this is our last hurrah, so this is all we got. In Chapel Hill, I'm Cassie King, Carolina Week Sports. Next up for Williams, Allison, and the rest of the heels, Virginia Tech, Saturday at 7 at Fetzer Field. The women's volleyball team faced off against a hated NC State Tuesday night at Reynolds Coliseum. The Heels expected an easy win against State, which had lost four ACC matches in a row. But against the Heels, the Wolfpack forced a deciding Game 5. The Heels held on thanks to Amy Beavers, Beavers' career-high 22 kills. This was their fourth win in the ACC. Well, guys, um, if you don't catch the game on TV against Louisville, you can check in with us on Monday for uh, highlights. Sounds good. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Will this year's American Idol come from the Tar Heel State? Carolina Week went to the auditions to check out our chances. The good, the bad, and the just flat off key coming up. When your children ask where you got married, will you have to tell them, over there by the unleaded? When we lose a historic place, we lose a part of who we are. Help protect historic places in your community. Visit nationaltrust.org. If you have a story idea, contact Carolina Week at 843-8292. You can also visit us online at carolinaweek.org. If you have questions about this program, Write Carolina Week at Campus Box 3365, UNCCH, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 27599. Well, Tara, are you willing to fa face the wrath of Simon to make it in Hollywood on American Idol? I don't know if I could handle that, but our reporter Kelsey Richards says that a lot of American Idol hopefuls could. Not everyone who came to the auditions was destined to be a star. In fact, some had never even sang publicly before. How long I've been singing? Today, I know that I have a talented voice, a beautiful voice, and it's not good to sit around and waste your talent if you have one. You got to get this understood. I did not make it. I feel hurt because I worked very, very hard this morning uh, to sing. And she'll just have to come back and try again next year. There were some good singers who showed up. You are so beautiful to me. One man was a little resentful about not making it. They claim <laughs> that I'm not strong enough vocally. These are the eyes of disarray. And my sister here, uh, they claim that she's not strong enough vocally. And Yet she's vocally trained. She's got the skills. I may not have the skills, but there's no doubt about my sister. She's got them. Crazy on you! You'll just have to decide for yourself whether she should have made it through to Hollywood. In Greensboro, I'm Kelsey Richards, Carolina Week. I don't think I whip myself through that. I don't think I could handle that one either. <laughs> so that's going to do it for this edition of Carolina Week. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good night.